Welcome. I appreciate everyone's attendance here. Uh, we're going to have a very informative session. And I promise we will not keep you long. And I promise I'm not going to hold the mic. <laughs> All right, so with that said, I don't see, or oh, I do see um, several department directors. So I would like to actually at this time recognize all of the staff and all of the department directors and team members of the Douglas County government to please stand up and be recognized. So one of the promises that I made as part of my campaign was to bring the county to our district. So tonight you see a great representation of our county government that's here in our district. So that is something that you're gonna see more of and tonight I'm gonna introduce shortly our panelists that will be bringing presentations and updates to each and every one of you as it relates to the activities that we're planning, that we have in motion and that we're looking to implement here in District 3. So in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce them. But before I get started with the introductions, I'm wearing pink today. And as many of you know, this is Breast Cancer Month. So by chance, are there any breast cancer survivors in the audience? So I wear this in honor of you. I think we've all had members of our families, friends, associates that have been uh, impacted by breast cancer. So not only is breast cancer something that we're going to continue to fight to eradicate by all forms of cancers. So again, congratulations and utilize this as an opportunity for my tribute to you and for those that are in the fight. With that, again, I am almost 30 year resident here in District 3. And I like to call it a dues paying resident, meaning that I pay taxes. I've been a homeowner here in Chapel Hill for 28 years. And it's been many years since I've been in this location because both of my sons graduated and matriculated from Chapel Hill Middle School. So I feel like this is coming full circle and it's an honor to have you here. So not only have I raised and worked to raise young men in the school system, in the public school system here in District 3, but one of my sons matriculated from Chapel Hill High School, while the other one matriculated from Douglas County High School. Both of them were able to get in the college of their first choice because of the public education that Douglas County provides to our students. So I am very proud to be here, and I want to thank Dr. Trent North and the principal here at Chapel Hill Middle School for allowing us to have this meeting and this opportunity here tonight to talk to you, our community. So with that said, let me talk to you a little bit about the agenda for tonight. So we're going to talk a little bit about human resources. One of my pledges was I was going to ensure that our county residents, and specifically District 3, knew about jobs here in Douglas County. I want to keep our residents here with high paying and good jobs. And tonight, if you're looking for opportunity, we have our Human Resources Department with laptops for you to go out and to apply right here tonight online for opportunities in Douglas County. So again, that is a promise that I made and you will be seeing more of that as we ensure that our residents have an opportunity to work, live, and play within Douglas County. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our Human Resources Director, Ms. Danielle Nichols, to come up and bring words in a presentation. Ms. Nichols, good evening. Thank you, Commissioner Raxton, um, constituents of District 3, and of course, our mighty and powerful 
uh, employees of Douglas County and the leadership. I'm uh, glad to be here before you this evening. So I'm Danielle Nichols, Managing Director of General Services, and I have oversight and leadership responsibility not only for human resources, but for um, five other departments, which includes risk and safety, information services, records, animal services, and project management, which is a new department within the county. So to talk about human resources specifically, we are in, well, first I would say general services is the internal client facing function of the county. So we deal with internal clients. And while we do not interface with constituents directly, unless you are an, you are an employee or you're seeking employment with the county, we deal with the workforce of the organization. So having said that, human resources is what I like to call a strategic positioner. We look at the stakeholder requirements or expectations that would be the Board of Commissioners and business requirements which are given to us by the administration and we translate that into human resources or human capital needs. So under human resources, my, um, the goal of the department is to ensure that we have a thriving and healthy workforce. So that means not only are you physically fit, but you are also mentally fit. So we have done um, a lot of work over the past 12 months to ensure that we are infusing activities and offerings for our workforce to increase their viability with respect to maintaining a healthy um, work-life balance. So having said that, in addition to a healthy workforce, we wanna make certain our employees enjoy coming to work, and we also wanna give them um, offerings that stimulate uh, the way they look at what we offer, how we do our work, and, ha and take pride in the work that we do um, to serve the community or serve the constituents of the county. In addition to that, when you look at the human resources life cycle, we are responsible for talent acquisition, so the onboarding process when it relates to seeking talent within the county. As Commissioner Rick Raxton indicated, um, the HR team is here. Um, I would like for them to stand up again. This is not all of the team, but this is most of the team, and um, we have a team member over here to your right. So I am, I am glad that they're here, and we are a small team. We're a team of seven, including myself, and we do a lot of work that comes through, so we make certain that the experience for our workforce is the best that it could possibly be. Having said that, from a recruiting perspective or a talent acquisition perspective, if you are interested in any work within the county, um, there are a number of opportunities that are posted on our job board. We are here to uh, talk to you about any of those opportunities. Whether you have seen some or you would like to go to the website to look at what's out there, we would happily or gladly talk to you about the opportunities that are currently available within the county. Um, in addition to recruiting, we also look at the workforce planning of our organization. So we want to make certain that we're managing our bench strength we can identify um, a succession plan. So as we have members uh, that are in leadership that matriculate out of their leadership role, we wanna make certain that we have strong leaders in place to backfill those that are exiting and typically retiring for the county. We also wanna make certain that from a benefits perspective, we have strong and solid benefits uh, that we offer to our employees, and we have one of the best benefit offerings that um, most counties um, don't offer in terms of our benefits offerings. So we have a lot that we can pour into our workforce, and we definitely encourage you to come speak with a representative of the team if you're interested in any opportunities that we have here, or you may know someone who may be interested in an opportunity or any of the opportunities that are posted. So I would happily ask questions. Is this an appropriate time for that? Okay, are there any questions? Okay, hearing none, I will be here throughout the duration, and I am glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Commissioner Raxton. Thank you. Thank you, Director Nichols. And again, it was important to bring this to this county, to this district, to this meeting. So please, 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 we have the laptops out front. 
take a look. We have the team here that will talk to you about opportunities. If you know of someone that's looking for a job, let's go pull out your phone, text them, tell them to get up here. Tell them to come because we have an opportunity right here tonight that we don't want to lose for someone that's looking for an opportunity to grow their career, to come and work for Douglas County government. So again, thank you for that presentation. So next on our agenda is transportation and some of the activities that you see on the poster boards here that we're doing as far as with the infrastructure, with the improvements that we're taking place here in District 3. One of the things that is critical and crucial for me, and I am a stickler about this, is I want that grass cut. I don't want the grass that's too tall. I don't want to see a lot of litter. I want beautification. I want that pride. I want what we used to call curb appeal to be a part of District 3. So trust me, Director Rana has heard my ear too many times, but I have to agree that he is doing a great job in helping to ensure that this district looks pristine. In addition to that, we're going to talk about some things. It's very subtle, but I had a concern about traffic. So we made some tweaks on Chapel Hill Road to the traffic signals to try to push through traffic, especially during peak hours, to try to ensure that we're not backing up all the way to I-20. So he's going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm hoping that you're starting to see some of those improvements with what we're doing with the traffic signals here in District 3. And then in addition to that, let's talk about development. Let's talk about what you don't want. You do not want liquor stores in District 3. You do not want storage units. You do not want Dollar Generals. You do not want waffle houses or gas stations. So guess what? When we're at the Planning and Zoning Board meeting, we're hearing these cases. We're hearing applicants from developers. So as your voice, please continue to let me know what it is that you want to have to bring into District 3. We're an advocate for you, and I trust that you will give me that opportunity to serve as that mouthpiece. So if you don't want to have certain development to occur, come to our board meetings. Come to our planning and zoning meetings. Let us hear from you so we can ensure that we're doing right by you and by us as our residents. So with that said, I'm going to ask now for our transportation director and engineering director Mr. Suleiman Rana to come forth. Suleiman, thank you. All right, good evening, residents of District 3. <clears throat> Welcome to Commissioner Raxton's Town Hall. Uh, my name is Suleiman Rana. I'm the managing director of our transportation services, uh, which is a newly formed division uh, that combines three departments. DOT, Department of Transportation, which is my core department, Public Works, that is responsible for landfill and fleet operations, and uh, Connect Douglas, which is our transit agency and also present here in the panel today. DOT is responsible for moving over 100,000 daily riders in Douglas County that depend on our infrastructure for their daily needs. And what we need in order to make that a reality is very large pieces of equipment or infrastructure. Uh, here in Douglas County, we own 720 miles of roadway, 93 bridges, about 100 signals, uh, over 40,000 traffic signs, and about 400 to 500 miles of roadway striping. All of this to support the da daily riders on our roads. Our mission is to provide the necessary planning, design, construction, and maintenance of all critical infrastructure pieces across the county. Uh, within, within our umbrella, or within the core department, department of transportation, there are three divisions that make all of these uh, projects, maintenance uh, needs uh, uh, a reality. Uh, one of that is road maintenance. Levon King, our road maintenance manager, is present here in the audience. Second department is traffic operations. That includes traffic, signs, striping, anything that directs the flow of traffic. That is led by Carla Pichetli, who's our traffic manager, present here in the audience today. 
Lastly, our third division is program delivery, which is responsible for securing federal and state funds to fund mega infrastructure projects and also to execute locally collected tax dollars in form of uh, tax, property tax collection or SPLOS dollars. That being said, uh, I also want to take a second to recognize our uh, maintenance operation managers, Lavon King, uh, Carla Pachetli, and our fire chief who are here in the audience who worked tirelessly during the storm relief efforts uh, over the past uh, week. They worked overtime when no one else was here in order to ensure safe access for our residents and ensuring that services that are critically required by all residents are achieved. I request them to be to stand and be recognized. <laughs> that being said, and echoing back on Commissioner Raxton's comments about maintenance, uh, maintenance certainly remains our biggest undertaking in Department of Transportation. The vast network of infrastructure that I just mentioned requires extensive resources uh, for them to be maintained in a proper order. With 720 miles of roadway, you're looking at hundreds of acres of right of way that has to be maintained, litter pickup, and all of those efforts can be very expensive. We have in-house crews to support those efforts, but we also rely on our contractors to facilitate or supplement some of those efforts. In coordination with the board, administration, and Commissioner Raxton specifically, uh, over the past few months, we've uh, talked about some of the urgent needs here in District 3, some of the major arterial and collector roadways that need additional attention in terms of litter and right-of-way maintenance, and we're making progress uh, as we speak. And uh, over the next few years, I think we're planning towards improving our resources where we are able to maintain everything in the order that it should be maintained. That being said, um, I'll take this opportunity to mention a few upcoming activities in District 3 that relate to transportation improvements. Uh, one of the recent achievements we had in District 3 was the completion of Stewart Mill at Reynolds Road Intersection Improvement Project, which was about $3 million worth of a project. It widened the intersection to include turn lanes, extended two culverts, while also supporting thousands of daily riders at that intersection. And now I think District 3 and the administration agrees that it's in a much better condition than it was before. Uh, that project was in the years uh, of making and finally completed in 23 under budget. Next. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next I'll talk about what's in the pipeline. Uh, Chapel Hill uh, is certainly the spine of District 3, but also the county. And it, it, has received, it has attracted a lot of growth around this roadway. And in return, what we have is congestion, excessive delays during peak hours and sometimes after peak hours. So there are various projects mostly funded by SPLOST currently and much, many more which could be a reality if T-SPLOST, which is on the ballot, and that, if that is passed. As we speak today, we have three active projects on Chapel Hill. The idea is to capture the two choke points, which is one at I-20, the interchange, second one at 166, which is an intersection improvement, and lastly, the biggest issue of Chapel Hill is corridor widening. That remains to, that is the most expensive piece of it, but we are strategically widening a middle segment of the road using SPLOS dollars. <coughs> if T-SPLOS passes, we could potentially widen the entire Chapel Hill corridor. So I'll start off with the Chapel Hill road widening. This project is funded through SPLOS 2016 and SPLOS 22, a total value of about $10 million, the largest locally funded project without any straight state or federal funding. This project will widen the travel lanes from West Chapel to Dorset Shoals, from two lanes to four lanes, add sidewalks alongside the corridor, and basically improve uh, the connectivity and mobility along this 1.3 miles of a corridor. Next, we have interchange improvements that are federally funded, uh, valued at close to eight to $10 million, which we recently kicked off the design on. The board accepted the design contract with a vendor called KCI Technologies. Uh, the goal here is to, is to improve the turning movement, the, the excessive peak hour traffic that, uh, that uses Chapel Hill interchange from westbound and eastbound approaches. 
We also recognize some of the safety concerns on the interchange. For example, the ramp curve, uh, the deficient turn, turning uh, lanes at the westbound off-ramp, eastbound off-ramp, and then along with that, there's widening needs uh, uh, before and after the interchange, which means the project limits will be from Houseville Drive all the way to Arbor Place. So first, we'll increase the turning capacity of Houseville Drive at Chapel Hill by adding a turn lane. We'll widen the corridor starting from Houseville Drive all the way to Arbor Place with the addition of travel lanes, sidewalks, and turn lanes. Then the ramp, which is westbound off-ramp, currently has a very sharp curve and puts you at a very strange angle as you merge into the ongoing traffic of Chapel Hill. That will get realigned, widened, and will be much more safe to use once it's improved. Uh, overall, this is about 0.7 miles of widening, like I said, valued at $10 million, supported by our federal partners, but also supported through your SPLOS tax dollars collected here locally. Lastly, our third active project is a roundabout project at the intersection of Chapel Hill and 166. This intersection sees a high volume of traffic going by. We've seen levels of service dropping and a lot of safety hazards that are increasing the number of accidents on this intersection. There are various street lights projects active on Straight Route 92. This intersection and the corridor uh, around this intersection will be covered through street lights, but this specific intersection will be converted into a single lane roundabout, which is currently being designed and projected to be in construction towards end of next year. That completes the three active projects, but like I said, if these plus passes at the end of this year, there will be two additional projects in Chapel Hill that will connect the gaps that these three projects will, complete, uh, will create. Basically, ha having a fully widened corridor over six miles of Chapel Hill. Next, I'll talk about signage maintenance. Uh, like I said, county owns 40,000 signs across the county. District 3 has a big share of those signs. Uh, under Chair Ramona Jones-Jackson's leadership, we initiated a signage beautification program across the county about over a year ago. Uh, given the results of that program, we've tripled the numbers of signs that are replaced across the county, and as citizens, you might have observed a reshaped outlook of signs across the county. Uh, just in District 3, we've replaced close to 600 signs over the past 12 months, and we think there's a lot of potential to grow that number on a yearly basis as we progress. Next, uh, road resurfacing. Uh, road sur resurfacing is a very important piece of our uh, DOT operations. Uh, while we focus on improving and adding new infrastructure, our biggest responsibility is maintaining the existing infrastructure that's already in place and is being used by our residents. Resurfacing costs have gone up significantly. Uh, uh, to be honest, it's gone up, it's tripled over the past three to four years. Uh, coming out of COVID, construction costs have skyrocketed. Regardless, uh, we remain committed to maintaining the uh, roadway to the best we can with the resources available. It's about half a million dollars to resurface one mile of roadway. In county, we have about 720 miles. In District 3, we have about 200 miles of roadway. So you can imagine the cost that it requires to resurface the roadway over a period of 15 to 20 years, which is the generally accepted lifeline of a roadway. In District 3, over the past three years, we have resurfaced or are currently resurfacing. This year's resurfacing contract is active and happening as we speak. We are projected to complete over 10 miles of resurfacing in District 3. That concludes all the active updates or active projects in District 3. Um, I will lead this into the conversation about uh, the gap between the maintenance that we're performing in today's time versus what we should be maintaining given the vast number of networks or infrastructure that we have. Uh, that requires, that, that gap requires to be bridged using a significant dedicated funding source that could allow proper maintenance, proper upkeep of our, of our roads, our signs, our traffic signals, while also giving the department or the county the flexibility to uh, enhance the capacity of our infrastructure as the county grows. And I think it's, it goes without saying that the county is certainly feeling uh, the growth pains. Uh, there's definitely pressure on our existing infrastructure. And uh, there are ways to improve it. But in transportation world, it can be very expensive. Therefore, we have a lot of posters in the back of this room that present our active projects, but also the proposed projects, if the voters decide 
to accept the TEAST Plus program, this will generate about $150 million of tax revenue strictly for transportation improvements across the county. About $50 million plus of that money will be spent here in District 3, facilitating mega projects, for example, Chapel Hill and other improvements that we can talk to you about after this event. Lastly, I'd like to mention that after this event ends, please take a moment to walk around the room, meet with our staff, and learn about some of the existing projects, the proposed projects under the SPLOST and TSPLOST programs, and would be happy to answer any questions related to those projects. I will conclude uh, my remarks by uh, coming back to Commissioner Raxton's point about signal optimization. Chapel Hill is about a six, six to seven mile uh, long corridor. Uh, that certainly has capacity issues. We've got more riders on the road than the road can support, causing congestion and delays. But one tool that we have at our disposal is traffic operations through signals. Uh, uh, under Commissioner Ragston's uh, leadership, our traffic team has been looking into timing, strategic timing of our signals to facilitate peak hour movement. Uh, in doing so, we have recently implemented some changes. In fact, our team was hard at work even today to implement some of those remaining changes. And our end goal here is to, receive, uh, uh, is to achieve at least 5% reduction in our delay. And I see, I see my traffic operation <laughs> managers pointing out it could, go all, it could trend all the way up, to, uh, up towards 10% of delays, uh, which is a significant win uh, simply by optimizing our existing operations. Uh, now, this inv involves technologies that will have to be updated, lifetime monitoring, uh, that we have to adjust uh, on, um, on, I think, a uh, weekly or a monthly basis, but as we head into holiday season, we have to be cautious of that, and there will be timing adjustments to facilitate that specific movement. Uh, but regardless, we remain committed to optimizing our existing infrastructure, but while also planning and working towards securing federal, state, and local funds to improve uh, the road network that we have within county. With that, I'll conclude, and I'll open it up for any questions you may have. Yes, uh, so that uh, I believe it's uh, the Highway 5 Pool Road Roundabout project. Uh, it's been in design for a long time, currently in right of acquisition. It is a GDOT funded and delivered project, but as a local partner, we like to receive updates. Uh, from our last meeting with GDOT's leadership, we were informed that it's scheduled to be constructed in early 2026 as they approach right of a completion towards end of next year. Question. Um, development that's coming, for example, on, on Dorset, Sh Dorset Shoals Road, uh, that you have under contract 45, uh, 43.5 acres of land, without almost going to have 50 single family homes. So or do you keep abreast of, of that kind of building that's going on and plan for maybe widening the roads before it becomes a choke point? Definitely. Anytime we are investing in over one mile of roadway widening, our planning process includes looking into traffic projections all the way up to 20 years beyond the open year of that road. What that does is it gives you a standardized average of growth in an area using different methods. And with that, your capacity that you're trying to improve today should improve or have lasting impacts all the way up until the next 10 to 20 years. Because if you're doing a project today, chances are you're not gonna be able to come back to this segment in the next 10 to 15 years. So that's why we consider the growth, and we plan our, uh, we, we do our capacity analysis accordingly and make sure that enough capacity is provided for the next decade or more. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is there any projection to widen the Chapel Hill Road in the, from, from the high school down to the mall in the near future? Yes, sir. Uh, we currently have a federal grant application pending at Atlanta Regional Commission. Most of the area starting high school towards interchange lies within city. It will require a joint partnership, but county remains prepared, and we are at the forefront of re uh, requiring or requesting federal funds to improve this segment of that. Uh, the segment that I mentioned takes it up from Dorset Shoals and runs it back to West Chapel Hill, but I agree this segment also needs just as much attention. Is that Right. Uh, Certainly. A federal aid project can take anywhere from six to nine years. 
if funded today, um, we can get right into design and within five to 10 years time period, we can certainly see that project materialize if the fundings are approved. So does that mean that there won't be any sidewalks added until that project is completed? Because definitely a need for sidewalks, because even as we do the cleanup of Chapel Hill Road, because I'm responsible for that section, it's like it's, it's just, it's almost unsafe to be walking. So for us to do cleanup, and just imagine who else has to walk down there. Um, is that something that can't happen until this project because it'll affect the widening? So. Certainly. Uh, good question. Sidewalks remains uh, this board's and administration's top priority. Any road project that we do, we include sidewalks with that. So the Chapel Hill widening section that I mentioned, it's about 1.3 miles. It will have sidewalks on both sides. Now for the segments that are currently pending applications, we will have answers towards end of this year, whether it be t loss, whether it be federal funding, and at that point we can better uh, plan if sidewalks need to go first while we work out funding for the next 10 years plus but if a project is planned for four to five years then I think it's best to wait for the project to come in because otherwise that investment uh, will not yield much results okay question yeah. um, I know that you're saying you're waiting for money and funding but we can look at that road right now and have some kind of can you really build sidewalks on this road? Well, certainly if the road can be widened and added sidewalks, just the road itself can certainly have sidewalks added. There's going to be costs associated with it. We're roughly estimating uh, 1 to $1.5 million for every mile of sidewalk added. That includes drainage, grading, and all the components that, that are required. So it can certainly be added if it's allocated by the board and administration. Uh, but like I said, that's a decision that, that would be best made towards end of this year. So that's just talking about money. Right. I'm talking about uh, it's a one lane road. Sure. How can you buy one? So you're talking about Chapel Hill, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So this road right here can yep. go down back to where I work. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, the construction feasibility is doable. I mean, you could argue if it's easy or difficult to construct. End of the day, if that's the project that the county undertakes, we can design it appropriately and get right contractors to construct it. It's going to require extensive grading, right of acquisitions, uh, some engineering to happen uh, to make this project a reality, but it can certainly be done. And we're about to demonstrate an example uh, just uh, uh, south of this high school with about 1.3 miles of widening. And that has like one road each lane, uh, well, each way? Existing is two, we'll go to four with sidewalks added on both sides. We have a question. Okay, finish your question. Now I was gonna bring the mic over here. Uh, it takes. Uh, I've worked for the courthouse for a few months. It's taken me now. Uh, it used to take me 12 minutes to work. Now it's about 22 minutes. Same route. <coughs> Why? Like, uh, like I said, uh, it, it goes without saying. The levels of service of Chapel Hill Road is dropping. That's because capacity is not enough. There are more riders than the road can f uh, handle, and that's why you have delays. Then there's a lot of subdivisions along the corridor. There are, my, uh, there are intersections that slow the flow down. Uh, so levels of service services are certainly dropping. And the answer to that is A, optimization of ex existing signals that's already underway. B, is enhancement of capacities, which is the projects that I discussed. And we have a question over here. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Right now I have some more waiting. One second. I'm sorry. Um, I live in the plantations at Dorset Shoals Road, and I, re I mentioned to different members of the county about adding speed bumps because of the excessive speeding in that neighborhood, uh, so much that a car overturned, hit a rock, hit a curb, and caught fire. Uh, we are very, I'm, I'm on the board there. We're very concerned we're going to lose a kid because I don't know why people don't recognize that as a subdivision. So, um, we, we really just want to know um, who can we really talk to to seriously uh, get a study out there for speed bumps because it's, it's dangerous yes. um, for the people who live in that neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, we have our traffic operations manager here in the room. Um, I'd recommend you speak to her after this. There's an application process where you have to get a certain uh, number of signs from the local residents, but uh, there's certainly a process in place, and our traffic manager will be happy to help you with that. 
I just want to know, how soon would the construction start on Chapel Hill Road? Chapel Hill widening is currently scheduled for fall 24. Uh, we are in right of acquisition. Uh, we cannot have a definite schedule because it's too early in the process, depending on how the remaining acquisitions go. We're currently ahead of schedule, but we're heading into the difficult phase of acquisitions, which is the remaining 15% of the parcels that we could not negotiate deals with. So that will pretty much define the schedule, but it's safe to say fall of 25 is the current let date. Any more questions? Thank right. you, Suleiman. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rana. And I, too, echo the concerns that we have for speeding, as well as the concerns we have for sidewalks. So any new opportunities where we can bring in new development, new widening of roads, we're going to ensure that the developers fulfill what's in the contracts and as Director Ron has said, sidewalks is definitely a part of that. Okay. So I echo that. I also echo that it takes me a while now to drive to the courthouse. It's taken a lot longer. So again, we're looking at opportunities to optimize the signals and other opportunities to move traffic through accordingly, as well as if we're able to do certain things as planned, hopefully, and this is what caught my eye. I just want to see if everyone else caught this. Um, Director Ron indicated that out of $150 million T splice, that $50 million will be allocated towards District 3. Did you catch that? $50 million. That's over 33%. So I hope that really catches your ear. Again, we're looking to make some real strong and heavy investments in our district moving forward. Okay, but we need the support of the community. So before, uh, and I know we talked about litter and trash, and I want to thank you for talking about the cleanup that you provide and the services you do on Chapel Hill Road, and I was there for one of them. I'm going to ask um, Director Wendy Cotto from our um, constituency services to come up to talk about an adopt a spot, which is an opportunity that we have here for Douglas County and for District 3. I want to spearhead that. I want to see some signs going up. I want to see volunteers invested in our community where we're out at least once a quarter beautifying our roads, making them safe and making them clean. So before I ask Director Carter to come up, I do want to recognize um, one of our distinguished elected officials who is my boss, who is someone that helps govern the county government of Douglas County. Would you please welcome me as we receive Madam Chairman, County Commission Chair Board, Ms. Ramona Jackson Johnson. So Madam Chair, thank you for being here. And Madam Chair is a resident of District 3. <laughs> so Ms. Caldwell, if you'd be so kind just to come up and just share a couple words in regards to the adopt a and again, this is going to be something that I'm really pushing under this administration. So I'm going to be looking for everyone to support this, embrace this, and we're going to be talking to organizations, nonprofits, for profits, residents about joining the adoptive spot that we're looking to really push forward here in District 3. Good evening, everybody. My name is Wendy Cottle. I'm the head of the Constituent Services Department. I'm here tonight to speak about the adopt a spot program, which is one of our beautification programs. It falls under Keep Douglas County Beautiful. And Keep Douglas County Beautiful is an affiliate of Keep Georgia Beautiful and Keep America Beautiful. It comes under those bigger umbrellas. Um, and we have several programs under Keep Douglas County Beautiful, but Adopt a Spot uh, is one that Commissioner Raxton has really been very interested in. Adopt a Spot is where a person or a group can choose a place in the county. Um, it could be a roadway. Um, it could be um, some other location, um, almost anywhere. We just, it just has to fall under the county. We don't, the city has their program, but the county's program is Adopt a Spot. So just about anywhere in the county. And you come and clean it up. Now you don't have to cut grass. 
you don't have to mulch, you don't have to, I don't know, dig ditches, you don't have to do anything like that. You just go pick up the trash and keep the area clean. We'll provide you with trash grabbers and trash bags and buckets and um, the, refl the reflective vests and, and all of that. Um, you can come check that stuff out and when you're done with your cleanup, you, you bring them back. And after you do two cleanups, you get a nice sign that says, Citizen Sally Smith keeps this spot clean, or something along those lines. You'll have to ask Suleiman because they make the signs down there. Um, <laughs> but it says something like that. And as long as you're keeping your spot clean, you keep your sign there. So it's a great way to have some uh, great community service activities. If you belong to an organization and you're looking for something to do, or if, you're orga if you work with um, high school kids and they need those community service hours, or your church, whatever it is. It's a, a great way to um, do something nice to our community that only takes a little bit of time. Um, if you are interested in it, you can send me an email. You just fill out an application. Um, we make sure the spot that you're looking at is available, and um, we go from there. You can even choose how often you keep it clean, but we, we recommend once a month or once every other month so like if you're ambitious 12 times a year uh, or no if you're moderate 12 times a year if you're ambitious no, I had it right if you're ambitious 12 times a year if you're moderate six times a year so uh, if you have any questions I'm sitting back there you can come talk to me about it and I hope somebody wants to adopt a spot <laughs> One, two. I want to make sure everybody hears you. So just so y'all know, I'm Kenneth Reddick. Uh, I have the Brothers Brunch Foundation. Um, we have most of Chapel Hill from Chapel Hill Crossing down to Grace Lake. Um, one of the things that we do, it is an easy process to sign up. They got some nice new blue vest, as, as County Commissioner Raxon. He <laughs> loved his. But um, we have even, the way that I even present it, I even put it out to the community as a way for the community to come together, to meet at Fowler Park. Uh, Jason's Deli has sponsored 20 box lunches each time that I've done it. It gives us an opportunity to even connect with parents that are there with their kids for soccer on Saturday. And so I'm able to talk about, we represent mental health and self-care. So it, it, it's all about, too, the way that you look at it, because I did not look at it just as an opportunity for me, but I looked at it as an opportunity for the community. So if y'all ever see too much going on on Chapel Hill Road, y'all can go on Facebook. I'm always posting Brothers Brunch Foundation, or either Kenneth Reddick, and just shoot me a message and say, hey, Mr. Reddick, look like it's getting a little, I ride up and down and I look too, because I don't want my road to be trashed. I'm up in Bear Creek, but I got to come up and down every day. So please, if you can, I don't think anybody had, the last time I checked, nobody even had Douglas Boulevard. But I chose Chapel Hill because this is where I am. So please, if you can support, I want to vouch for the program. Oh, well, thank you for that endorsement. Okay. All right. Any questions, comments? All right. All right. So again, this is something I'm very passionate about. Other organizations that I belong to outside of a resident, we have an adopt a mile and I'm um, with the organization where we have a mile stretch in Smyrna. So I see the beautification and what it really does to the value of that community. So again, thank you for your work. Thank you for your team's work. And again, please feel free to reach out to Wendy Cottle and constituency services if you're interested. All right, let's talk about something I know you wanna be passionate and hear about, <laughs> property taxes. Yes. <laughs> so I knew I wasn't going to get any amens on that one. So under this administration, I have good news. We rolled back property taxes from the Douglas County Board of Commissioners this year and for 2025. So with that, we're going to be tightening the budget, though. We're going to be tightening our belts. But we felt very, very passionate about giving our residents, us, me, an opportunity to have a breather from increase in value, increase in property taxes for Douglas County. And I'm only talking about the county now, not the city, not the school, just the county. 
So we're very, very proud of that, and we're looking forward to hearing from you, and hopefully that relief will be something of great benefit to each and every one of us. So with that, one of the things that I keep hearing is that, hey, what type of exemptions exist? How can I get additional relief from my property taxes? So what I ask is our chief appraisal, Mr. Steve Balfour, to come forth and to give an overview about property taxes, assessments, and ways that you can take advantage of the opportunities that's afforded to you for getting tax exemptions. So with that, Chief Appraiser Steve Balfour. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Chief Appraiser Steve Balfour, and with me this evening is my Deputy Chief Appraiser, Adrian Larchevaux. She's back there. All questions should be directed to her. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as Chief Appraiser, I just want to let um, you know that we are appoint, um, we are subsidiary to the Board of Tax Assessors. And um, the Board of Tax Assessors are my boss. And one of my bosses are here today, Ms. Diane Connors. She's a member of the board. And for those who do not know, um, Commissioner Roxton was a former vice chairman of the Board of Tax Assessors. So he knows a little bit about <laughs> what we do. So um, our primary function is to prepare a digest. What is the digest? The Tax Digest is basically a compilation of all parcels in Douglas County, which includes a listing of all assessments and exemptions. It's um, real and personal property, timber, mobile homes, motor vehicles, heavy duty equipment, and public utilities. So that's our responsibility each year to compile by class and strata, all parcels in Douglas County. And um, our next slide shows um, our parcels by breakout. So in Douglas County, unincorporated, we have 40,707 parcels. The city of Douglasville has 10,484 parcels, Villa Rica, has 3,018 parcels, and Ostel has 90 parcels, and there are two tax allocation districts in our county, and um, the Lee Road tax allocation district has 132 parcels, and the Douglasville, City of Douglasville tax allocation district has 1,392 parcels giving us um, the total parcel responsibility of 55,823 parcels. Would like to also give you a breakout of our parcels by types. This is something we do. Um, the digest must be identified by owners, by size, characteristics, types, class and strata, residential, home, commercial, so, etc. So, our next slide shows the breakout of the parcel types that we do contain. And um, for agricultural, we do have 51 parcels. Brownfield, which um, you may not hear of, we, we have our first two brownfield parcels in Douglas County. And brownfield are parcels that have been were contaminated, and uh, an investor who sees fit will cure the contamination and they will acquire the property. They do get a tax break for um, resolving the contamination. And um, we have two brownfield properties here currently. We have 2,062 commercial properties. We have 893 exempt. We have um, 515 industrial. Uh, we have one forest land protection act. And we have four qualified timber parcels. We have 51,770 residential parcels. We have 168 utilities. 
And for CUVA, you may have heard of CUVA, which is Conservation Use Value Assessment. We have 376 of those, those type parcels. Personal property, business personal property, that is. We have 8,233. And uh, manufactured homes or mobile homes, we have 2,010 of such parcels. What is our role? The assessors locate and identify all taxable properties. So we are responsible to discover all, list them, value them. So we make an inventory of all taxable properties, including quantity, quality, characteristics, and ownership. We classify and stratify each property and determine the extent of taxability. We estimate the fair market value of each taxable property. Then we, we calculate the taxable value for each property and um, establish an assessment ratio. We prepare and certify the assessment rule for all jurisdictions, which we, that, that's what is called a consolidation sheet, after which we pass that consolidation sheet to the tax commissioner's office who does tax collection, tax billing. So we notify homeowners of the taxable values of their properties, which we do by sending out the assessment notices. And after that, it's the other busy period when we are busy um, defending values and estimates of value and the methods that we do value properties. So we, we do have the BOE and um, hearing officers. How do we value properties? The Georgia Department of Revenue has requirements. And these listed here are the three main requirements. Our assessment level is the very first. We are required by the state to value properties within 90% and 110% of what they're sold. So if a property is sold for uh, 100,000, our value must be a range, range between 90,000 and 110,000. And for all communities, for all parcels. So this keeps us honest. These are criteria that we must meet for a certified digest. So that's the first respond requirement. The next requirement is that we must be uniform across the county within neighborhoods. And that number that we need to meet is the COD, the co coefficient of dispersion, which must be for residential parcels within 15%. So it's saying we need to be uniform within 15%. So there are a range of values, but outside 15%, our digest will not be certified by DOR, Department of Revenue. And for commercial properties, we have a little bit more leverage. We have a 20% um, uniformity, our coefficient of dispersion. And the final measure is to see how biased we are with our um, appraisal. So um, ideally, the coefficient, the PRD, the price relation differential, should be one. But um, the county and state, the state gives us a range of 0.95 to 1.1. So these are the three main criteria that we need to adhere to and submit these numbers for a digest certification. And I must say, we submitted a digest and um, we, were, we had all values um, lined up. Our, um, our assessment ratio was at 95% and um, we got our certification from the state. We already have, so the tax commissioner can now send out a tax bill. So um, these are what's required for the digest certification. On receipt of the digest and um, other authoriz um, authorizing the use of the digest comes from the DOR. So upon determination by the commissioner from Department of Revenue State, 
that the county tax digest is in proper form, that the property therein has under appeal within the limit, of course. So we also are guided by how many appeals we have. We need to have uh, an appeal count, and it needs to be within a certain ratio. And all that is looked at, and then, if it's satisfactory, the state will say, okay, the tax commissioner can proceed with collected taxes. So that's required before any taxes can be collected. So we recently received our authorization to collect taxes. So in a, in a nutshell, this is, um, we're showing what the Board of Assessors do and versus the tax commissioner. So we approve and deny exemptions. We classify and stratify property. We determine values, fair market value. We establish, um, we accept applications for um, forest land protection. We do conservation use value, homestead values. We work through taxpayers' appeals and we look at um, various certifications, for example, brownfield certifications. And the tax committee, and then we finally produce a consolidation sheet and pass, it, pass that on to the tax commissioner's office. The tax commissioner's office then forward the digest values to the board of commissioners and the schools. They certify the PT 32.1 percentage of tax increase. They certify and submit the digest to the Department of Revenue. And then once they get the approval from the state, the bill, they can go ahead and do bill collection. Now the Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Raxton's team, they establish the annual budgets, they set the millage rates, and advertise and hold public meetings. And right here I have a display of the, um, the basic formula that's used, budget divided by the net assessed value produces the millage rate. So that, that is key. So we can see that the budget is directly proportional to the millage rate. And increasing the millage rate increases the budget, decreasing the millage rate decreases the budget. So this is why Commissioner Raxton has said what he just said. And um, this, this year they have um, decreased the millage rate so constituents should see a reduction in their tax bill if all things remain the same. So um, in a nutshell, the tax assessor's office determine values. We have three main methods of determining values, market, cost, and income. The board of commissioners, they determine the millage rate and uh, the tax revenue required to fund the county's budget. And then the tax commissioner's office calculates the tax bill which um, in um, a simple formula, in the individual property tax assessed value times the millage rate. And that's how we produce the tax bill. And this slide shows an example of um, what, and I'm only looking, I'm excluding the school board, I'm just looking at the county. In 2023, our millage rate was 12.313%. In mills, it's 0 0.012313. If we took a $300,000 home at 40%, that assessed value would be 120,000. If that person had a S1 exemptions, which is the basic exemption of $6,000, the taxable value would be 114,000. With that millage rate of uh, 2023, that tax bill would be roughly 1.43 thousand. This year, uh, with the decrease in the millage rate, um, the, uh, this is what the, there would be a definite decrease if, all, if the value on your home remained the same. So a decrease in the millage rate would directly result in a decrease in your tax bill if your home value remains the same. So um, our next slide is showing um, the all possible exemptions. I must say, tax um, homestead exemptions is applied to at the tax commissioner's office. And um, Adrian, I brought some of their pamphlets. They have some trifles that um, gives the details of all 
the um, exemptions that are available. I must say that um, the, their, the department, they did a marketing campaign and um, we had a large increase in the amount of applications. In 2023, we had less than 3,000 <laughs> applications. In 2024, we had about 6,000 applications for Homestead. But um, we want to be fair to all constituents. It's, good, it's a good thing Homestead exemptions work, and um, we're encouraging all to apply for a homestead if you do not have already. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell, what the appraisal department does. I'm here, Deputy Adrian is here. If you do have questions, feel free. I am ready to answer your questions. We are ready to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. Is this found on the uh, internet, I mean on the website, yes? I am not sure the details of this one. Um, no, just talk about the homestead, yes, it's on, it's on the website, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. You were saying if home value stayed the same from 2023 to 2024, the taxes would be lower? Yes. What have you found percentage-wise, how much the values go up or go down between 2023 and 2024 on average in the county? And this mic is not on. So it's, um, I can't specifically say, um, in some neighborhoods there was like an 11% increase and in other neighborhoods there were um, increases above, above 30%. So it depends on the neighborhood. And I must also say that we are required by the, the, by the state to uh, look at properties or reappraise properties at least um, every three years. So we need to, um, we don't actually get to all communities every year. So 30% might be something you hadn't gotten for the last three years. Yeah, correct. And uh, <clears throat> if I wanted to appeal my assessment, I, I just want to make sure I get this part right. I will have to use the sales from the previous year, yes. and not the current year. Yes. So okay. we are mass appraisers, and our valuation date is January 1st. So we value properties, unlike fee appraisers, as of January 1st. And um, unfortunately, um, the fact is, if, you, if on January 1st we valued your property, and on January 2nd something should happen, um, and your property lost value, your value would remain the same because our appraisal date is, is as of January 1st. Of that tax year, not the previous year. Of the current tax year, correct. So we would look at the previous year sales if we are um, looking at that particular property. Yes. I just wanted to know more about the brownfield properties um, and what were the contamin contaminants of the properties and if they affect anyone out here in Dunn's County. No, and I, um, I can't speak to that now. I, I don't have the information regarding what was the contamination, but it, it did not affect anyone and um, they, it has already been resolved and the property is now owned and they're benefiting from, from um, curing the contamination. It's cured or is it It's cured, cured. it's already cured. Okay. Yeah, so this, it can only be cured to become a brown field. So the EPA um, has issued a certificate that it's cured. Can you tell us anything about that law that's on the ballot? About the homestead and assessments? I um, signed up for a training session regarding that. Um, not much is known about it. I know it's coming, but I can't speak to it. I am awaiting um, information on it, but it's gonna be on the ballot. That's correct. It's a Senate bill and it's, it, I, I don't know either. I won't speak to something that I don't know. I'm awaiting, I'm signed up to, to get um, some more knowledge on that topic, but it's Senate Bill 581. Any questions? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Well, thank you, Mr. Bell, for we appreciate that. And hopefully you found that of information to be informative. Take that back to your community. Inform your residents, inform your family on some of the activities, some of the ways that property values and how they're being evaluated and how it impacts our taxes. So again, hopefully you found that to be <coughs> substantive. And again, thank you very much for that overview and presentation there. All right, so when I was on the campaign trail, a lot of times I would knock on doors and I would get this stunned look. And the look was that, well, I didn't know there was an election going. I didn't know that um, you know we've changed or there's been change in administration or um, that our um, U.S. representative has changed in our district. So it was a lot of things that was informative and educational for me. So one of the things under my administration I'm very big on is increasing the amount of communication that we receive in District 3. And one of the things that I'm looking at, and I'm working with our communications team, and they've heard me say this several times, that if there's an opportunity that we can get text messaging, because everyone has a phone, if there's an opportunity that we can utilize that, that's something that I'm looking and we're hoping that we can bring forth. And one of the things that you're going to see that I'm very big on is that I want us to be the proof of concept. I don't mind taking chances. I don't mind for us to be the first early adopters when we have new technologies and new things that we can share with our community. So with that said, I would like to bring to you our chief communications officer who is doing just a phenomenal job of ensuring that information is shared out to our community, to our residents. Uh, what you see on DCTV, the team members that's behind us that's taping this, that's recording this, that's putting this on, and someone that is definitely in an award-winning group, might I add, here very recently that has received a very prestigious award, I would like to bring to you, for her to bring remarks, on some of the new initiatives and activities that we're doing from our communications team. That's a none other than Yvette Jones, Director Jones. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you so much, Commissioner Raxton. Yes, I have heard your pleas. <laughs> and we're going to see what we can work out. So what is the Office of Communications? What do we do? I like to consider us the eyes, the ears, and in some respects, the voice of the county. Of course, in tandem with uh, our Board of Commissioners, our county administration, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, on behalf of the constituents of Douglas County. Uh, I have been with the county since, um, gosh, it's been about a year and a half now. Um, we always like to joke, my third day on the job was the state of the county, and so I, you know, it was just trial by fire. Um, but it's been good. And one of the things um, we have been working on since I started was defining and refining who we are who we are as a county, how we want to message ourselves, how we want to be seen, um, who we are, what is our brand, how are we recognized. Um, so those are the things that we have been working on for a, a good bit. And one of the things I've been saying to the team is that we are in constant pursuit of excellence. We're chasing excellence every day. And you know, some days we fall short. <laughs> you know, there, there are days that we are trying things and it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to work. Um, and there, there are times when we are excelling at um, some of the things that we have tried, some of the innovations we um, put into play. And um, Commissioner Raxton, thank you so much for mentioning our um, award we are very proud of a recent award we got which was a national award um, for communications excellence from the city county government uh, marketing association um, we recently received that and so um, but we don't stop there and we're not in this for the awards we're in it to um, do the best that we can on behalf of the board of commissioners on behalf of all of the employees who work for douglas county and on behalf of the citizens so just a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, I feel advanced, Daryl. 
So what is our role? We oversee internal and external communications, operations, and messaging across uh, all platforms. So that's broadcast, digital, social, and mainstream media platforms. So um, you know, if there's a message that has to get out, we are the ones who are working to put that together, whether it's via a press release, whether it's via um, cameras, or um, that's, that's the work that we do across those platforms. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do when we, uh, when I began, was to, to give some structure around the work and what fuels us, what drives us. And so we came up with a mission. And our mission is to, as you see it here, effectively disseminate accurate, timely, and reliable information that enhances public awareness and understanding of government programs, initiatives, resources, and services with the goal of developing a better informed community. All right. And on that note, um, Ms. Bachtel, I heard you just ask about, well, well, I don't know about that bill. I'd like to know a little bit more, because if it's going to be on the ballot, I want to know some more about it. So one of the things we're constantly doing is kind of listening and learning and trying to understand what are some of the things we need to educate around. So as Director Balfour gets some training on that, maybe it's, hey, come into the studio and let's talk a little bit about this uh, initiative, this bill, and let's educate our community about it. So um, we're al always looking for opportunities to wrap um, our brains and minds around information that we need to be passing on. So, Director Balfour, you're Sounds on standby. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so not only what fuels us, but um, what's our vision? Where do we see ourselves? Not, not just where we are now and what's, what's driving us right now, but where do we see ourselves? What do we want to be? How do we want to be seen? So we also created a vision statement. And we want to be a standard bearer of excellence in government communications. We want to get it right, and we want to do it well. We really, really do. Um, and we want to continuously value and uplift the voices of Douglas County and those who serve it through innovative, informative, engaging, and collaborative communication strategies. And th those are not just words that we have up there. This is, this is a mission and vision we live by. And we talk through as we you know, meet on a regular basis as a team about you know, how we want to communicate, um, what is the message we want to send out, and how do we want to be seen as, as, a, as a brand. And so the team. Um, a good portion of the team is here tonight. We are a small but mighty team. So under the communications umbrella, there is the graphic operations team, and there is general communications, and there is production. So I would like to just pause for a second, because the, in the room with us tonight are people who help me make the magic happen every day. So I'm looking here, I see Kristen Moses, who is our senior communications specialist. Um, she's on the general communication side with me, uh, where she helps to write press releases and put stuff on social media and take pictures and um, help us, you know, all the things, all the written word, she's helping us do that. Um, and then I see Stephen Oposky, who is our production manager. He joined us in February, in the January, February. And um, he has taken us to just unbelievable heights. And when I say um, we're chasing excellence, I really, really mean it. And Stephen Oposky is a gentleman who, when he feels like he misses whatever mark he sets for himself, he doesn't let go, <laughs> you know, and I have to hear, I wanted to do it this way, it should have looked that way, and I'm just, and I said, Stephen, we're only human, right? And so sometimes, you know, we, we set the bar, but sometimes, you know, we're, we're learning and we're growing. And so I'm really appreciative of the things that he is doing on the production side of, of things. He's, he's revamping our station and really wanting it to be a class act. Um, he is, one of the people behind um, really making the magic happen for the award-winning video um, we were just recognized for, so thank you, Stephen Oposky. And then there's A.J. Fareed in the back, who is our production assistant and producer, and then uh, Sierra McCoy is our senior multimedia specialist, and I like to call her kind of a jack-of-all-trades because she's always running around doing a million things. Um, and then uh, not in the room with us tonight is uh, Levante Mooring, who's our graphic designer, and then Mark Poole, who is our graphic operations manager, and uh, Michaela Tappan, who is our digital media specialist. So th this is the team.
this is a team. And so, how do we get the word out? What, you know, what are the, the vehicles we use? So we've got DCTV 23. We have social media. Facebook is, um, you know, seems to be our most popular platform the, where we have um, the most followers. Although the young folks say they don't do Facebook, that sort of thing. So, but we also have uh, a, a YouTube channel. We have Instagram and just a sprinkling of followers on X, which is uh, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and then we have our print and digital publications. Many of you may be familiar with Happenings, which is our e-newsletter, which is, um, was a weekly distribution. We have um, scaled to a monthly distribution as we work to sort of revamp content so that we can create something that we feel will be um, user-friendly, beneficial, and provide a, a breadth of information for our constituents, so we're working to revamp that. And, and we want to be mindful of not cluttering anyone's inboxes, so, um, but I think our next edition of Happenings is actually going out tomorrow morning, and Kristen is behind our Happenings publication, and we'll be working to revamp our digital media, uh, digital newsletter as well. And then our website. Um, you may have noticed that we were once Celebrate Douglas County Dot com. We, at the top of the year, transitioned to douglascountyga.gov. And part of that was uh, security concerns, right? The .gov uh, provides a, a lot of protection against um, would-be hackers and, and protects us as a government agency because not just everyone can get that .gov um, domain. And I'm looking at uh, Taylor in the back there from our IS team. I'm, I'm going to butcher some of that IS terminology, but that's, that was part of, uh, part of the reasoning. And then also it was because we were trying to bring everything under that Douglas County brand. We felt like there was um, a little bit of fracturing in some parts because, you know, we were recognized this way under this name. We were recognized, you know, this way under that symbol. And so we were really trying to define and refine who, who we are and who we want to be. And again, it all falls under that Douglas County government um, brand. And a note about our website, we are undergoing a revamp of the website. So I've, I've heard internally, I've heard externally, it's, it's, you know, the functionality is not great. You know, I want it to be a little more user friendly. I want to be able to do this thing or that thing. We've heard you and we're working with our vendor and um, look for a revamped website at the top of 2025. We are currently in the process of, of, of doing that now. And then, of course, mainstream media. Uh, we are the central liaison for all media requests and inquiries on behalf of the county under the county administration umbrella. So if something's happening, you know, the, the television stations or newspaper outlets or radio, they are calling our office for more information. And then, of course, I've mentioned some of the work that we do. We, you know, messaging through press releases, social media, media relations, content creation. Of course, we do television and video production. That is Stephen and his team. And then event coverage, BOC meetings, hearings, town halls. Um, and then community engagement events, we are there alongside our constituent services partners to capture those moments and to replay them for our citizens and a little bit more of you know, the work that we do. Of course, advisories and uh, strategic and crisis communications. Um, and I can, I see Chief Allen has his head down now because he's afraid to show his face <laughs> after text messages at five o'clock this morning. My point here is when there's an alert or an advisory or emergencies that happen, we don't stop, right? And so I got you know, messages from Chief Allen, sometimes calls in the middle of the night. Hey, I've got an overturned tractor trailer. We need to get a message out on social media. Hey, this is what's happening. How, how do you suggest we best message this? Um, that, that's our role. And I'm the one getting those lovely calls, so. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Allen. Um, and then brand manager. All of that falls under who we are, who we want to be, um, and how we want to be recognized and known. And then these are just some of the highlights of some of the work that we have done over the course of the year. There was the groundbreaking at uh, Station 9. We had election night coverage. Um, and I think we were the only one, at least for a couple of times this year, we did, um, thanks to um, 
Sierra McCoy, we had election night coverage, which was a blend of live and recorded um, election night coverage for both runoffs and um, the races over the past year, um, where we recorded some informational pieces, and then the night of the election, we were running live results on our station, um, on, on our station and on Facebook Live, and expect that we will do that again in November, so that those results are there at your fingertips. And next slide, please. Yeah. And then again, some more highlights, just kind of uh, highlighting our work. The Inside Douglas County insert you see there was in the Chapel Hill News and Views in um, June, and it was a, a freestanding leaflet that was just a publication highlighting the people, the work, and the progress in the county. And look for us to do more of those as, as the years go on. And just again, some notes about some of the things that we have done under that brand management umbrella, uh, updating our website and social media names to fall under that Douglas County umbrella. Um, and then another thing we did was we updated our logo. Um, and this, the county seal did not change, the, the green and gold with the, um, the county image there, but our logo, our community facing logo did change to um, this image you see here. And again, that it goes back to trying to refine and, and define um, who we are as a brand. And so a little bit about the story of the colors here. So we wanted to keep the traditional green and gold, and then the blue represented some of the um, progression of how we have um, been recognized in the past few years with the blue and the white. And then that little bit of red there represents the elevation. We've talked about that um, we are moving in a forward direction, but also in an upward di direction as well. So that those are what the colors represent in our new logo. And that's it from me. If you have any questions or want to reach out to us, um, we, you can reach out to us at communications at douglascountyga.gov. That is an email box that is shared by all of us, so anybody on the team can see it if you have questions for us. That is my time. I thank you so much for listening. All right, any questions? Oh, Ms. Baxter. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I watch DC uh, TV 23, uh, usually the VOC meetings. There you go, Ms. Spackle. Okay. And I have, uh, I'm hard of hearing, so I have closed captioning turned on my TV. Mm -hmm. But when the meetings come on, the uh, closed captioning doesn't work. So I don't know if that's me or if that's you. It's us, okay. and thank you for bringing that up, and we are well aware of it. We are actually working with our vendor to make that a reality, and uh, give me about a month, and uh, we hope to have that closed captioning uh, available and working. Okay, and also, when I watch the BOC meetings, they don't read the consent agenda, so I don't know what they're voting for unless I look up the agenda on my own or watch the work session, so I would suggest Showing the work session two, or showing so we do. agenda. So we do. We are oh, watching the, the work session as well. Yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't see it on the TV, for some reason. Okay. And then the other thing I would ask is something that I would like as a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly go to the senior center and videotape one of their chair aerobics uh, sessions, and then show that on TV so I can exercise? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty easy ask. We can, hand, we can handle that. Thank you for that. I'm sure uh, Dr. Uh, Consuela Gilchrist, who runs our senior services, would love for us to do that. And in fact, we did one of our features we did uh, a couple of months ago was an, an exercise program, an outdoor exercise program that senior services unveiled at uh, Lithia Springs Senior Center. They're nodding to me in the back. Yes. So we would absolutely love to do that. Thank you for asking. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, much. so thank you so much for that overview and again a lot of great information and communications is very very important so that's why I want to ensure that we brought that forth here today um, so you can hear some of the great things that we're doing and when we talk about branding that's very very important to us so again 
kudos to you and the team for the great work that you're doing mm -hmm. and how you're leading that effort and how the team is here tonight. And I want to thank you personally for being there. Um, they're going to actually allow me to get in front of the mic and to do some things as a um, district dialogue discussion. So I know that's going to be entertaining. I'm definitely looking forward to doing that and supporting that effort. So yes, again, every, more to come. Every commissioner has their own district dialogue show that runs on DCTV 23. And those, um, the times of those shows correspond with their district number. So that will be at uh, 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. that uh, Commissioner Raxton's district dialogue will run once we get the first one in the can. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. All right. Well, thank you very much. So our last speaker for this evening is going to be none other than Ron Roberts, who's going to talk about Douglas Connect. And one of the things that is passion for me, I'm from up north. I'm from a major city, Cleveland, Ohio, and I use, you know about Cleveland? All right, we got another one in the house. Go Browns. And I'm very passionate about public transportation. It was nothing for me to go to high school and catch public bus. I took the transit, that we call it the uh, rapid transit system there. And I'm very passionate about expanding that here in Douglas County. And the opportunities that I'm even looking at, and I would love your input, is how do we go about expanding it? And I would absolutely love my, you know, if I had my druthers, I would love for our shuttles to go out to the airport and to go out to the Marta station at HE Homes and maybe even expand it to downtown Atlanta. But that's my vision, that's my dream, but it's gonna take a lot of discussion and a lot of thought and preparation to make that happen. But we do wanna hear from you, our citizens. So in the future, Daryl Moss, who you've heard here, that's my legislative aide. Show your hand, Daryl. So we're going to get on some of these shuttles, and we're going to ride, and we're going to interview the riders, because we want to hear from you. We want to hear from our public. We want to hear what is it that you want us to do, how do you want to expand it, and what can we do better? So we're looking forward to that. I think we're going to go out later this month, so I'm looking forward to that ride. So again, coming forth to just talk about and more about what the services are what we're providing and even some of the routes is none other than Ron Roberts, director of Douglas Connect. Ron. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you for having me here. Makes me want to get some Skyline chili. I didn't know that you were oh, yeah. from that area. Oh, I grew up in Austell, but I know what that is. Okay. I don't know who put me on the agenda after Silky Voice down there <laughs> and put me as cleanup here, but, uh, but we are going to talk about passions. We are going to talk about transit and I'll, and passionate, and we do want to talk about transit. I'd like to acknowledge, uh, well, Madam Chair's already been acknowledged, so good to see you. She spent some time with me last week. She also feels the same way as you do, Commissioner. She feels very, very passionate about, about transit. Now, if you guys aren't familiar and uh, with our, our transit agency, I want to give you a little bit of background. So um, in 1986, Douglas County, before Cobb County, they started reporting on MTD data, okay? That's the national transit data because we were running van pools out of the county. At its apex, we had 33% of all the van pools in Metro Atlanta coming out of the county. Then COVID happened, right when the, the fixed route service was getting started. So you got a, you got a double hit there, you know? Um, we rolled out last year, it was a, a year long effort to produce, uh oh, sorry about that got my cheat notes rolled out last year our transit master plan which was adopted by the the board of commissioners in December my deputy director Eric Wright raise your hand Eric I thought I was gonna be here alone but I'm glad you're here because I brought all of our stuff to talk to the people <laughs> now the um, we did roll out the new the new fixed routes they are doing phenomenal the support of this board of commissioners for transit has been phenomenal they voted uh, for us to open up the new transit routes in conjunction with our um, with free fares, new routes, free fares. Our ridership has been through the roof. We've actually transported more people through August than we did all of last year. Why is that important? Because the way funding works from the Federal Transit Administration, and I, I, it's not just running buses. There's a complex system of of reports. The government doesn't give us this much many millions of dollars for us to run a transit agency in this county without being responsible and without 
knowing exactly what that is and how to report for it. And we have a good team, um, not just Eric, but, but uh, our compliance officer and the rest of my staff, um, they do a really good job. Um, and we are good stewards of this funding. So higher ridership means more funding that comes into the county. Our fare box collection was about 2% of our uh, overall budget. And that's just being fair. In some systems, it may be as high as 6 or 7%. But in Douglas County right now, that's the way it is. Now, we do have um, uh, some goals and some plans that were produced through the transit master plan behind me. And Ms. Bactel knows this well because she participates on our paratransit advisory board. And the reason I got to Ms. Bactel because she was the one who was always complaining about transit at the meetings. So who better to get on your side? So we've, we've heard about, and some of you may have heard about, demand response. That's what this map is. So we have fixed route that operates, and I brought just the charts for District 3. Um, and they're here on this board. There's three, there's three of them. I only had one easel, though. Um, at, we will be available for questions afterwards. I want to talk to you about it and everything. And it's not just the fixed route that's doing well. But we also have the um, microtransit. This is where we would put in these locations vehicles that would run continual circulators at people's call. They would call and get into the fixed route system. There's also an initiative, and Suleiman mentioned this earlier as well. Um, it's TSPLOS. We have uh, $3 million all allocated on the TSPLOS for transit. And believe me, Eric and I and my staff can do wonders with that extra funding. Believe me, because we've done it. We had some extra ARPA funding, um, and it came in. And it was a block grant, and we used it for transportainment, which is what we called it, um, in District 3 and 4, of getting people service that did not have service before. Nothing. So as, as Eric would say, that we had we given them the appetite. And unfortunately, that funding ran out. So now we, we've had experience doing it. We know we can do it. Any, any, transit, any, any kind of transit you guys want, we can design and, and do it. It's just a matter of the funding. So it's always the funding, isn't it? But um, there's an unwritten law when you're the last speaker and it's late in the night. And um, I did have a PowerPoint. Uh, it was about 50 slides. But uh, I, I drove off and left it on top of the bus when, when I was coming over here. So what I want to do, oh, hey, hey, yeah, there you go, applause. Um, but I, I just want to say um, I wanted to, to thank the commissioners and thank you for the opportunity. And what I really want to do in the, in the time that we have is um, Eric's now here. We're, we are here. We would like to, um, I brought some handouts that, uh, our communications person developed on our reduced fare cards for the fixed route, the paratransit ADA service, and our transportation voucher program. Now, our transportation voucher program is different than the fixed route. It's different than the ADA paratransit. We have 14 private providers that are in the county. The, the seniors get the vouchers up to, uh, they pay $40. They get $400 worth of vouchers under that program. It's another grant. Um, and they are able to use that with the private providers for trips to wherever they want to go. Um, and so that, that in itself is, 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 is a good program and it's been around for a long time. Uh, I know that um, when we, the transportainment uh, grant petered out, we got a lot more influx into, into that program. We're always looking for, for other funding sources. Um, definitely. Um, Definitely excited about the direction. We're definitely excited about the leadership that we have in the county and the direction that we want for transit and we want to hear from, from y'all. And so uh, I don't really, I just want to be up here for questions and, and, uh, and if so if you got questions, just go ahead, hit me up. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, so as we close out, um, one of the things that I would share with you is when I was out campaigning, 
a lot of times I would get questions on, well, what is it a county commissioner does? What does county government do? So one of the things I'm going to bring to um, District 3 is we're going to do what I call a basic civics 101. And it's something that I would like to implement here, something that we could do maybe on a quarterly basis, but we'll open it up on a Saturday and just bring the residents in and just talk about the county, just talk about what operations look like. What is it that I do? What is it that the, the board does? What is it that the um, Madam Chair does, et cetera? And just to ensure, again, I want to import information and communications to this community. So the more opportunities we get for that, I want to make sure to take advantage of that. So be on the lookout for that, and we're looking to put something on the calendar in Q4 of 2024. So more to come on that, and we'll be communicating that out to the residents. So before I close out, and again, thank the um, staff for coming, I do want to open up the floor as I open up for all the other speakers to see if you have any questions of myself or any of the speakers or topics that you've had um, presented tonight. So are there any other questions or anything we may have missed? Or um, if it is, um, my business cards are out in the front. You can feel free to reach out to us. So if you don't have anything tonight, let me know. But again, we are available to serve you. You are our stakeholders. It's you. So we answer to you, and we take that extremely serious. OK? Yes, sir. I'd yes, like Robbie. to tell you that we really appreciate your personal because you come out even to talk to uh, everybody, and that, that's appreciated. No, thank you. So, uh, no, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I second that. Please. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I believe in being a part of the community, being vested in the community. Again, I've been here almost 30 years, so this is my community. So I have a vested interest in ensuring that we do the best for our constituents. All right. Well, as we close out here, I just want to take a personal point of privilege of thanking all of the different departments that attended today's meeting. We have representation from communications, engineering, Department of Transportation, Information Technology, Human Resources, Constituency Services, Board of Assessors, Board of Commissioners. We have our Assistant County Administrator here with us, none other than Tiffany Stanley Stewart. We have um, the Connect Douglas representatives, and certainly I could not pull this off without having my right hand with me and that's none other than my legislative aide, Daryl Moss. So again, thank you. So if there are not any other questions or comments, we'll hang around, so feel free to come, take a look on the different charts on the boards there. I'm here to hang out to answer any questions. So I hope this has been informative. Have you gotten something out of this today? Yes. All right, well thank you so much. Have a blessed day and be safe. Thank you.